Hello everybody, it's Classic David with yet another podcast. I'm here with Curtis. Hello. Hello. Today we have again a very uh, broad, very broad range of topics that we're going to talk to you about. We are going to do a market update uh, about um, Bitcoin, S&P, DXY. We'll look uh, at on uh, some on-chain data. <clears throat> we'll talk about the geopolitical uh, uh, tensions again because that's a hot topic still. And uh, then we will talk about the Bitcoin uh, bull, uh, bull case long term. So we're going to have a look at the next like uh, one to three years time. And we will talk about the possibility of Bitcoin crossing $200,000. We'll talk about the bonds. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the, the, boom, the boomers household net worth. Uh, and Gen X Millennials, uh, we'll talk about uh, KPMG, Adopt Crypto, and also about the Canada and the incident with the trackers and them freezing the bank accounts. Uh, Curtis is Canadian, so uh, I'm sure that he uh, he knows more about, <laughs> about all of this than me. And uh, last but not least, we're also going to argue uh, about the possibility about whether Bitcoin is going to lose number one ranking within the three years time, uh, because I think it will we'll leave that at last. So let's start with the uh, with the market update. So let's start with the Bitcoin. Uh, do you want to start, uh, Curtis, or do you want me to start? Sure. Sure, I can. So yeah, we're, it looks like we're thirty nine thousand three hundred, mm -hmm. and it's um, it's Mon in Tokyo. It's Monday, uh, Feb twenty first at five p.m. So um, um, yeah, um, I don't know what to say there. Obviously, the low was around thirty five um, in mm -hmm. February. What was that? What was the date of that? February. What was the low? Uh, oh, at the end of January twenty first. January twenty first. Was the yeah. daily closers were about 35k. Yeah, and then, yeah, so we got back up to 44, and then we've had a really sharp pullback again uh, to 39. Um, <clears throat> so not much to say there, I guess. Um, as little as a few days ago, it was at 44,000 and, and looking very strong, uh, but it's pulled back. So. Um, well, I would like to say uh, when we had last time our our podcast, it was sixth uh, of February, I believe. Uh -huh. uh, we were about uh, around forty three k, and yes, I remember I was pretty bearish. <laughs> and today I'm actually more bullish. Although I did expect, I think I was talking about the the, the pullback there. Um, uh, but there are some indicators that are pretty bullish. So I am overall, I'm actually more bullish than last time and two weeks ago. Um, uh, we did not hold this blue line is 50 day moving average. Uh, it's right. pretty massive once we cross it and hold it. It happens then on a number of occasions and then the price kind of surged. So mm -hmm. we did not hold it, however, but there are other pretty bullish uh, indicators such as uh, the people started shorting like over the, the past 14 days. There have been lots mm -hmm. of shortings uh, uh, even yesterday. Uh, also the over leveraging uh, started rising, but this time uh, the people are uh, uh, again, the, the open interest on the market is rising, but uh, uh, it's now due to the shorting and that's actually very bullish. It, I think all of this is just uh, has just begun. I think it's going to have to take for maybe a couple of more weeks that I think some kind of a decline is necessary to make people more short, I believe. But this is overall, in my opinion, pretty bullish and it inclines that we might see in the near future uh, actually some bullish uh, price action. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I guess we could flip over to the S&P now. All right, let's go. So S&P 500, my red circle I mean, is still there. <laughs> again, for, for some of your listeners that aren't follow or, or maybe new to this, um, this is our third chat. And um, we've each, each video we've been talking about the correlation, you know, the risk on risk off correlation with S&P and Bitcoin. So basically Bitcoin is selling off with stocks and it's uh, strengthening with stocks. Um, and you can see the S&P 
again went down and so did Bitcoin, right? So if you look at the, we're testing new lows in the S&P and we're, we're, look, we're getting to the mid thirties or high thirties again in Bitcoin. So, so the correlation continues, <clears throat> which is kind of bearish for, for Bitcoin, at least in the short term, as long as that correlation continues, right? Super um, there's short, a lot right? of downward, a lot of downward pressure um, with uh, the Fed raising rates, uh, the Ukraine um, issue continuing, and then um, just a general um, negative view of tech stocks and uh, growth stocks, uh, which tend to correlate with Bitcoin as well. So, so there's a, an overhang there in terms of the S and P vis a vis Bitcoin. I would like to switch to my special chart, uh, BLX slash SPX chart, because this chart, I've made this chart to somehow measure the correlation between uh, between Bitcoin and uh, S&P 500. This is uh, literally BLX slash SPX. So when this chart goes up, it's when Bitcoin is outperforming the SPX. When, when this chart goes down, it's the uh, SPX outperforming Bitcoin. And uh, what is SPX? What is SPX? SPX is S&P 500. That's okay. Ticker, okay. ticker okay. for S&P 500, SPX. Okay. Um, look, and, back, yeah, look at September 2021. Look how much Bitcoin outperformed S&P. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. In the, in the surges, in the bull, bullish surges, it's just more volatile it, it, and it behaves so. Also in during the dumps. So during the downside, during dumps, uh, Bitcoin dumps more than S&P 500. And during the bullish uh, surges, it of course surges more than S&P 500. Mm -hmm. But uh, 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 I brought up this chart also like two podcasts ago because we talked about some 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 beautiful lines that this chart has, has actually been hitting. For instance, like the very, very top of 2017, the top of the week was exactly like the bottom of the week uh, in the 17th of May 2021. Uh, I mean, 18th of May during the dump of the of the previous year and then also uh, the weekly closures uh, during the summer in 2021 that was also exactly on the same line. So there are uh, multiple ways you can look at this chart that this chart actually works and shows and can show pretty valuable things. And one of the most valuable things that this chart showed me also during the, the, the last autumn when everybody was bullish, this chart showed me double top, twin top. No other chart showed the twin top because on the fiat chart, uh, uh, Bitcoin actually, uh, uh, you know, made new all time highs and even closed, I think, weekly above these closures from from spring. So uh, and yeah, I'm talking about this chart because recently over the past two weeks, uh, Bitcoin, I think, is holding pretty strong. Um, uh, Bitcoin is on this chart. Uh, we are like uh, on 8.83, and just overall, this chart looks better than than SPX chart, of course. Well, of course, SPX mm -hmm. chart looks worse. So overall, I think that this chart is show showing us that Bitcoin has gained some strength, and I think it's likely to to uh, uh, to retain the strength. Uh, and show it when it's ready. Maybe it's not uh, uh, ready like this week or the next, but it might be ready soon. Unless there is the war, but we're going to talk about it in a minute. Okay. Um, I guess we could go to DXY just to touch on that. Okay, DXY. There we go. So it's kind of stabilized in a way. <clears throat> it's about the same as it was in December. So it's been about three months, now, two, let's say two and a half months around the 95 level as sort of the median there. Ah, uh, yeah, it's about 100 days, yes, going sideways. Um, so, yeah, but we talked about, of course, to, to the those watching, DXY is US dollar strength relative to all other fiats, a basket of fiat currencies. So it's, it's tracking US dollar strength. And again, this tends to be inversely correlated with the Bitcoin price. Um, as the DXY strengthens, the, there's some some downward pressure on on BTC. Yeah, uh, it started strengthening on the first of June, uh, 2021, and um, yeah, but you can have a look. For instance, it started strengthening 
in the 1st of February of 2018 when the, and then it was rising all the way to like 2020 and you know that these were uh, for Bitcoin uh, that was uh, bearish years so and inversely a uh, 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 US dollar had a, a bearish uh, year 2017 was very bearish for US dollar and inversely so it was bullish for uh, Bitcoin and you can see it on number of other occasions you can have a look to the history further like for, for instance 2014 another very good example you know bearish year for Bitcoin and bullish for for US dollar you can go through this in more detail Um, okay, so uh, do we want to add anything to the US dollar? It's just, yeah, it's, it hasn't really changed ever since we talked about it the last time, so... Right. It goes slow, this is a slow chart, more often than not. So if you look at it, you go back to November of last year, that is when um, the Fed okay. started mm -hmm. talking about tightening, right? Uh, so yes, that, the first the of November. Fed, so really, you can see that the that's when the you know quote unquote new the unknown news came out that the Fed was going to start tightening, and you saw the DXY strengthen. Since then, um, there's been a lot of talk, but um, the the prices were all the 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 D, the U.S. dollar strength was already priced in, right? Um, since December, we haven't seen much change. Uh, there's been a lot of talk, um, but you can see how uh, the market prices known information in immediately, right? Mm -hmm. In other words, the the price the pricing came in in November, not not now. Um, for for the DXY to strengthen further, we need to see some actual uh, action from the Fed, an actual rate hike of oh, yeah. some let's say 0.5 in March before we'll see any more yeah. strength. Um, yes. Usually by the time the market starts talking about it in, in the, the, the mainstream market, it's already been priced in, right? Yeah. Yeah. And oh. so we're looking for unforeseen, unforeseen rate hikes is what will cause further reaction in the market. So like a 0.25 raise in March is already priced in. Uh, mm -hmm. 0.5 is let not as much, so that would be okay. a surprise. All right, um, mm -hmm. and that's where you might see the market react negatively. You see the S and P fall, BTC fall, and the DXY rise. Mm -hmm. And then we might actually hit one of my two lines. Again, only if it's if if it's overly hawkish in the next Fed meeting, mm -hmm. which is I think 16th of March. Right. It was the mid of March. Yeah. I believe. All right, that was the DXY. Now let's go to on-chain data. Coin held, uh, coins held by the miners. By miners. So there this is, um, we've been looking at this for three three sessions now. So this is the miners' wallets, uh, how many coins they're holding. So it's obviously, it's on-chain data. We know uh, which wallets are the miner wallet, wallets. Mm -hmm. um, the black line is Bitcoin price. The purple line is basically how many coins they're holding. And mm -hmm. you can see it's been strong all the way through. Yeah. Um, you mm -hmm. Go back to January 21st, right? As mm -hmm. the price made its initial run up towards the 60,000, you saw um, the miners were holding and holding and actually adding coins, right? Mm -hmm. uh, from January 21st to April 21st. Right. Yeah. And um, uh, they're holding more coins now than they were uh, when the price was at sixty nine thousand. So they dumped massively when we broke the all time high in December 2020, obviously from this chart. And it yeah. looks like they have a new uh, a price target in mind. And from this chart, it looks like they're willing to, to wait for it. Right. But you never know when the next time when we're at 60k, you don't know whether they haven't changed their price target. Right. But, but so the point far... is that it just it continues the thesis that uh, well we can okay that's miners are not selling that's the conclusion. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Go to the next one, which is the um, exchange coins, coins on exchanges. Exchanges, yes. 
So it's very consistent. You can see, so what this chart shows, uh, again, the Bitcoin price is in black. Uh, the purple line is the lack of supply on exchanges. So as the purple line falls down, it's, it shows that there's fewer and fewer coins on the exchanges, which suggests there's fewer coins that people are gonna sell, right? Um, there is an OTC market. There's other ways to sell coins, but generally speaking, um, the coins on exchanges are at an all-time low. Um, so mm -hmm. less than the two yes. point, like about 2.3 million around there. Uh -huh. And it, it, again, it supports the idea that all the selling is done. Um, there is a shortage of supply. Uh, the mm -hmm. miners are keeping their coins and people are moving coins to cold storage and keeping them there. So both of these metrics um, show that um, the, the sell-off in price from the 69,000 down to the current levels was very short-term retail, um, what we'd call weak hands, right? And that um, the people that bought in 2021 sold off, but the um, the the diamond hands or the the, the whales and and the stronger long-term holders um, are either adding to their wallets or just holding hold standing pat right and um there's a lot of accumulation going on even though the price fell off yeah okay um the third one then we can just look at the the hash rate mm -hmm. and you see we yeah. hit an all-time high for hash rate uh last week two weeks ago so um hash rate is is an indication of the health it's like the um, yeah, it's the, the general health of, of the Bitcoin network. The higher the hash rate means there's more and more mining rigs actively um, processing Bitcoin transactions. And it's it means safer. there's it, there, it's it's it, 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 it's it's a more secure network. But oh, it also just tracks a general investment, right? There's all the mining rigs are firing away, and mm -hmm. um, and mining Bitcoin, and so it indicates a very healthy market. Uh, it tends to lead price as the hash rate rises, the price rises with it. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, there are some some time lags there, but um, it's still a very healthy indicator. Uh, yeah, we had a huge drop in the last summer, as you know, there was a ban uh, in China because China used to be the, the leader mm -hmm. in the mining, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I believe it was. So the ban there was a big thing and hash rate fell a great deal, but... It's recovered and more than recovered. It's actually, as you I just. I believe that's an all-time high. That that hash it, rate there. It's it's an all-time high right now. Yes. So um, it just it's a it's a confidence level indicator. In other words, um, the more and more miners that are are actively mining suggest they believe in the price being higher. They believe it's a good investment, and they believe that um, there's a future. Okay. And so uh, rather than, you know, news headlines, you, you look at people's actions, people that actually are putting skin in the game, so to speak, and, and uh, committing resources to the network. And that's the best indication of confidence. <clears throat> yes. Okay. Okay. So, so um, now let's yeah. talk about the hot topic, the geopolitical tensions which me being in Slovakia, being uh, close to Ukraine, uh, it concerns me maybe more than than most of you. So uh, yeah, I can feel that I can feel that the fear, uh, like everywhere around. It's uh, now, it's difficult to say it's too early for me to really know what is actually going on. Because one thing is what you can read and hear in the media. And the second thing it was what is actually going on. I am I am bullish. I'm pretty bullish now. I, I'm getting bullish, but uh, that bullishness is only as far as the war is not going to be there. I mean, if there is really going to be the war between Russia and Ukraine, uh, that might actually change even my uh, perspective. What do you think, Curtis? So yeah, definitely, it's very negative for stocks, and and we've just described that when stocks crash, Bitcoin crashes at least in the short term. Um, so yeah, you'd see the US dollar strengthen, you'd see a sell-off in S&P, and very likely you'd see a sell-off in Bitcoin. Um, um, interesting, just a few hours ago though, it looks like um, Biden and Putin might have a, a bit of a meeting. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems, it does seem like the, they're, they're moving towards war, but um, 
hasn't happened yet. The longer it doesn't happen, the less likely it's going to happen. But、um, mm -hmm. yep. I don't know. Is it a fifty-fifty chance? It's really hard to measure that, right?、Mm -hmm. Um, um, just... I really don't. I don't know. I, I've watched、mm -hmm. the BBC articles, and it, it looks like there's a lot of、um, there's shelling back and forth across the border, especially in. You can pull up that、uh, Donetsk,、uh, the east coast. You see that little orange? It's got the Ukraine and the little yeah there. Pull that up.、Um, I guess those are the problem Oops, areas.、Um... Yeah, hey, there、uh, Donetsk and Luhansk. So those、uh -huh. are they're they're pro Russia. Separatist areas, and that's、yes. where things would spark off, right? Yeah.、Um, so within those areas, there are、um, separatist groups that could、uh, trigger a false flag or、um, launch a missile at at at, at、uh, you know residential neighborhood and、mm -hmm. trigger something.、Yeah. So、um, it's very very well known strategy to trigger a war、um, is these type of false flag. Kind of um, activities. Um, so you know, if Russia wants a war, they're going to get a war, and、um, who knows? Who knows? Yeah, but we don't know what is going on yet. I mean,、uh, uh, you know, media is is extremely negative, extremely uh, uh, making extreme fears on people all over the media. I just pulled out now just a Google、uh, Google search. I just wrote. Uh, Ukraine crisis, and you can see extreme fearful, you know, articles all over,、uh, like、uh, has list of Ukrainians to be killed or sent to camps. Yeah, that's pretty horrible. Yeah,、uh, keeps troubling Belarus.、Uh, Russia blows past another off ramp,、uh, and you can see through all the articles, it's extreme, extreme fear. However,、right. in my theory. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's not really、uh, not necessarily as we、uh, all of these are Western media, I believe. All of、right. these, and, and it, in this country as well, everything that you hear is from the Western media. In my opinion, it's the propaganda of the of the Western media. It's too soon for me to be able to have any any idea、uh, where how far the propaganda goes and where it's、mm -hmm. actually reality. I don't、mm -hmm. know. I don't know.、Mm -hmm. I just think a lot of the propaganda is involved, and I think the war is not going to happen. But、um, I think this is all just to pressure people,、uh, to make people afraid.、Uh, I think the West needs to sell the weapons it already has. I think also there is a huge interest in all these、uh, NATO maneuvers because there's lots of money you know go into the maneuvers, and also the you know the soldier positionings.、Uh, Uh, in the countries, I think I think that's the intention. I I don't know really, but I think lots of this is just the propaganda and not the reality. I don't know well, how hopefully, much. Hopefully, hopefully. Okay. What, what's your take? If there is a war, what's going to happen with Bitcoin? Well, I was just saying. Yeah, obviously you'd have a a very, you know, I think a ten percent drop in the S and P over a couple days. And、okay. Bitcoin would would fall ten percent quite easily, I think, ten fifteen percent. Ten percent for the S and P that would be actually even below my red circle. Oh yeah, that would be the bottom part of the red circle, actually. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. The very bottom.、Um, Bitcoin would sell off probably ten percent. Now it would get bought back very fast, so it might be just a, a two day, you know, a two day、um, wick down. Um, obviously, it depends on what happens next. I mean, if they actually occupy Kiev, or if there's any sort of, you know, if there's mass casualties,、um, mm -hmm. the war could be very. I, I don't. I don't have any idea of how to measure what, how, how, how bad it would be.、Um, would it be over in, in a week, or would it would it be a, you know, a civil war or breakout in in the east, or or would there be Kiev occupied by Russian troops for six months? I mean.、Um, All those scenarios would be quite extreme, and and、um, uh, it could really rattle the markets. Oh,、uh, but yeah, ten percent for Bitcoin. However, that's not as bad as because Bitcoin is holding, as I've just mentioned、uh, a while ago, it's holding pretty strong. I think versus the S S M P five hundred, it's not as weak as it was over the past months. And ten percent would literally just come back to low thirties, but not really break, break, yeah, breaking them. So that's yeah, still yeah. pretty bullish, in my opinion. Right. As long as that happens. 
and especially if if you like uh, if you go there slower if i don't like a, a huge uh, a red candles far red candles but if we go there slow in the form of some descending which which if you go there slow that's going to be massively bullish because the shorting will accelerate the uh, there is going to be the massive uh, open interest on the market that is that is going to be short and then the squeezes happen once this when we have these conditions right right <clears throat> but yeah nobody wants the war <laughs> nobody wants right. it but why don't we um go to um the, the next point there and, and look a little bit a little bit more positive um the bull case bitcoin bull case okay so um let's frame this as um an argument for uh bitcoin hitting two hundred thousand dollars within 12 to 36 months so okay. um so clearly there's short-term risk there's 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 short-term downturn um and there is some overhang but let's look at 12 to 36 months out um and uh we'll use a, a bitcoin at two hundred thousand us dollars possibility okay okay some of this i'll give credit there's a guy named tom lee from fundstrat he's a big mm -hmm. uh, contributor on cnbc and i'm a big fan of his um so it's it's his call and some of this analysis is his mm -hmm. um but i think i can uh sort of wrap it you know uh, put it together into a concise argument here okay you can start with the interest rates all right interest rates over the last the so 150 yeah. years mm -hmm. Pretty well, you know, 1882 up to now, um, interest rates. So you can see the low is at about the, the one to 2%. Uh, we had a high in 1981, around or 1980 of 16%. I don't know if you can imagine that. Massive, massive. I remember I can't that. Imagine. <laughs> I'm older I than you. I remember I that. I was a kid. I was a kid when that happened. And you had mortgage rates mm -hmm. at 16%. Can you imagine okay. a mortgage rate at 16%? So was anybody taking mortgages? Back Some then? people did. <laughs> um, okay, most what of those did they people do? went bankrupt. Okay. Most of those people lost their house, right? Mm -hmm. um, when I was a kid, David, I would get 10% in a cash savings account. In the bank, in the traditional In the finance. bank, 10%. 10%, okay. So that's uh that's better than staking rewards <laughs> that, yeah most that's of cash them. most that's of them. cash yeah or maybe you had to put it in like a, a six month or a six month lock it in for six months but yeah 10 percent. so it's really hard for people to imagine that these days and mm -hmm. you can see historically that was very unusual right mm -hmm. um but anyways okay so we're at all-time lows and the reason we're showing this chart is it looks like we're at the bottom right Mm -hmm. um, you can't go lower than zero, theoretically, um, but historically we're at all-time lows. Mm -hmm. um, if you go to the next chart, you'll see the 10-year the treasury yield. Okay, so we're looking at 10-year bonds here and mm -hmm. the, the yield they've, they've paid over the years. So going back about 40 years, you could get around 11%. In 1985, you could get 11% on a 10-year treasury. Mm -hmm. um, now remember that price and yield are inversely correlated, right? David, you understand that how that works, right? If you have a bond, um, I that, actually don't. <laughs> to be completely okay. so fair, when you issue a bond, I mean huh? it's a little bit complicated, but when you issue a bond, you have uh, the yield on that specific bond, and there's a percentage set, right? Whether it's okay. eleven percent or two percent or three percent. <clears throat> that is a fixed yield for that particular bond, right? In this okay. case, we're looking at 10-year bonds. So in 1985, if you bought a 10-year bond, you would have gotten 11% per year for the entire duration of the bond, okay? So- uh, um, We have a question. Uh, we yeah. should, I think, start with saying, what is the bond? Because not maybe everybody clearly- well, It's a US, it's a, it's a US treasure. It's a, it's a um, you basically, uh, lend money to the U.S. government, mm -hmm. uh -huh. and okay. uh, in return you get um, you get interest, right? Um, and interest. then okay. you get your principal back, right? Assuming mm -hmm. they don't default, which they haven't. So, right. um, mm -hmm. 
But uh, people need to understand that the price of the bond will fluctuate as the interest rate on new bonds ver uh, ha uh, have variance, let's say. So um, uh, it's maybe okay. a little bit hard for people to understand, but so basically um, as interest rates fall, the price of, of the older bonds goes up. Okay, mm -hmm. because they well, were made during the higher interest rates. Well, you were locking in an 11% rate on mm -hmm. an old 10 year bond. And now you're only getting, let's say 2% or two and a half percent. So the price of those older bonds goes up. Yeah, I see. Mm -hmm. okay. I understand. So that's why we've, they say we've been in a bull market for bonds for 40 years, because those older bonds, as the, the interest rate on newer bonds, newly issued bonds uh -huh. fell, okay. mm -hmm. the value of those older bonds went up. That's why it was a bull market. So yep. falling but, interest rates okay. mean mm -hmm. the price of those older bonds go up in value. So look, at, from 1985 to now, you've had the price of bonds rising as the interest rates have falling. So we've had a 40-year bull run in bonds. Does that make sense? It does. It does. Okay. Now we're coming to the end of a 40 year bull market. Guess what might happen? Well, we might go the other way, yeah. right? We might go the other way. And if we do, yes, the price of the bonds will start to fall. The, of the old bonds. Yeah. So we will well, go into the bear of, market well, of the bonds. Yeah. So the uh, let's say a bond, let's look at a bond issued in 2000, right? Mm hmm. It was at what seven percent. So yeah. as as yeah. the new bonds, the 2022 10 year bonds start rising to two percent or three percent, the price of those older bonds, uh, or rather the price of the uh, sorry, I, I need to be more clear. The because bonds, the bonds issued. Let's say let's look at 2013. You can see it's okay. at like mm -hmm. one point or 2014, 2013. 2013, uh, it's like they were issued at let's say one and a half percent, right? Mm -hmm. Those bonds will fall in price and they'll start to yes. fall in price as the 2022 bond tenure because they will be better, you have a better yeah. yield. And you're going to see people that owning bonds, the price is going to fall and the interest rate does not cover inflation. So they're going to be losing on both accounts. Mm -hmm. Whereas a bond, an old bond, you might have had the price going up and, and the yield being less than inflation, real inflation, okay? Now okay. you're going to have both falling. You're going to have the price of those bonds falling, also the yield not covering the uh, real purchasing power, okay? Uh, all right, I have a question. When we so have the bond market is dead. The bond market is dead very soon. All right. Um, I'm not. I'm not completely clear about whether you yeah, are. Yeah. You can still buy like the bond that is more than ten years older, because when they are issued for ten years, so you can't. Uh, well, you know the the bonds from two thousand from the year two thousand, they're done, right? Yes, right. No so buy, so. yes, but it is show. What is that showing? Is that showing what had happened? So that's why when people say we've been in a bull market in bonds, they were saying the prices of bonds were rising as uh as the 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 current inflation rate was was uh, sorry the current uh yield was falling okay mm -hmm. um so yeah you're right so um now you can have longer bonds than 10 years right you can have 30 year bonds you can have um mm, okay. two year bonds and three year bonds but these are 10 um, at least but the point is we're moving from a, a bull market to a bear market in bond in in the bonds right and okay. this is a big problem because it's a massive market. Unless, and... unless the new bonds will have a yield that's going to be like five, six, seven percent. Well, even then, they're not covering inflation, but uh, they it might mitigate some of that inflation. Mm -hmm. But we just printed seven and a half percent inflation rate, and the ten-year Treasury is only paying two percent now, or two two and a half percent. Yeah. Um, so you're having you're going to have the price of bonds fall on top of mm -hmm. the yield not 
keeping up with inflation. So you're losing mm -hmm. on both accounts. Okay, so why does this matter? Well, basically, you're killing the bond market. Okay, and mm -hmm. killing the bond market means why would I put money into a bond? Why would I, why, why would I buy a 10-year bond? Yeah. If the price is going to fall, right? Because mm -hmm. interest rate, the re interest rates are rising and the purchasing power is falling because inflation is so high. There's no reason to buy bonds anymore. The bull market's yeah. over. Mm -hmm. Now, why is that important? You have to say, where is that money going to go? Yeah, one of these places I know about. <laughs> Okay, will it go into Bitcoin? So this is a very bullish argument for Bitcoin, right? And remember, we're talking about tens of trillions of dollars, right? Yeah. Um, so we're not. So when you've got Bitcoin at seven hundred and fifty billion dollars, and you have tens of trillions of bonds turning over, and people saying, "I'm not buying a ten-year Treasury," I'm going to lose on both accounts, I'm going to, the bull market's over. Uh, so the price isn't going to rise as well as I'm not getting enough yield. So of course it'll go into stocks. It'll go into Bitcoin. And real estate perhaps also. Well, real estate's in a bubble, but sure it could. Uh, um, yeah, as long as it is in the bubble. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Real estate yields though are very low. Real estate yields are, are like, like rental yields on real estate are, are, are very low. You're, you're getting what, four or 5% maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and so real estate's in a bubble. It is massive bubble. Um, so anyways, a big argument here is that the, the, the bull market's over in, in bonds. And, and some of it uh, might go where does that money go? Like, like most um, portfolios are 60, 40 stocks, bonds, right? Mm-hmm. So you've got 30 to 40% of people's portfolios are in bonds and they no longer wow. make sense. Wow. That's right? a lot. That's a huge portion. So, okay. So let, let's, let's just sort of um, bookmark that. Now let's go to the next one. Let's look mm -hmm. at um, the chart. It's got uh, generational wealth. So you can uh, see the purple, okay. blue, yellow, red. Yep. Yeah. U.S. wealth okay, generation. This, um, again, we're talking about the U.S., right? Uh, but we're looking at, uh the the four generations the silent generation which was like um the pre-world war ii generation okay. they're in their they're in their late 70s right early mm -hmm. 80s uh you got the baby boomers who are between 55 and 70 years old mm -hmm. you've got gen x which is somewhere around uh i guess 43 to 55 okay Mm -hmm. And then you've got the millennials who are now between the ages of what, 30 and 40 years old, approximately. I thought millennials are people born past 2000. Um, Is it? No. How I wrong? I Do think I wrong they're a little bit older than that. Okay. I've always thought it was... Uh... <laughs> It, so I've got the silent generation was born between 1928 and 1945. Okay. Baby boomers, 1946 to 1964. Gen X, that's my generation, is born between 1965 and 1980. Okay. So um, up from from uh, the oldest Gen Xer would, sorry, the youngest Gen Xer would be um, born in 1980. Okay. So, right. they're, uh, so, so I'm 32. a millennial. All right. Very, very fruitful. Uh, so uh, if you're 32 years old, you're, the, you're just barely Gen X. If you're 31, you're a millennial. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Okay. And then Gen Z is younger than that. And Gen Alpha is just the new babies. So um, what this is showing is the wealth. So... Um, again, Tom Lee's data, he said, um, basically, the baby boomers and the silent generation own all the wealth in the U.S., okay? Mm -hmm. um, let's put some numbers around this. U.S. household, uh, US household wealth is $142 trillion. It's a lot of money. Yes. So, and uh, out of that, 
76% of that 142 trillion is owned by the baby boomers and the silent generation. People over 65 years old have $100 trillion in wealth. Yeah, yeah. And um, that is... Mm -hmm. Okay, so all the money in the U.S. is owned by people 65 years or older, $100 trillion, <laughs> okay? That doesn't even include Gen X. If you add Gen okay. X, it's more like 85, 90%, okay? I mean, it makes sense 90, because those people own all the houses. Those people mm -hmm. have the stock portfolios, Companies, right? I mean, you can't expect a millennial is 35 years old. You can't expect them to have much wealth. They're just at the beginning yeah. building mm -hmm. stage, right? Okay. Yeah. Now, why is this important? Well, number one, it shows how much money is out there. But your average 65-year-old, your average uh, baby boomer does not is not interested in Bitcoin, right? No. They think yeah. it's uh, uh, magic the internet money. The Ponzi. Okay. They think it's a Ponzi. Okay. So you have uh, over $100 trillion that's not in Bitcoin. It's not in crypto, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. The question becomes what happens when this money starts getting inherited or passed down to Gen X and Millennial and Gen Z, right? I think it's very good for crypto overall. Okay. Situation. So if you go to the next chart, it's got the, um, yeah, here we go. So mm -hmm. this is very recent data, but you can see the trends are quite strong. Um, guess who loves crypto? Uh, household cryptocurrency ownership. So the most, of course, surprise, surprise, millennials. Millennials then, are buying crypto. And then um, those with income 100K or more. Rich people. So rich people are rich, uh, rich workers, not retirees. So people who are making a lot of money now, whether they're Gen X or millennial mm -hmm. or Gen Z, they're buying it. Um, you can see that men <laughs> like crypto a lot more than women. Okay. Okay. You see Gen Z catching up quickly. Look at the Gen Z chart. Look at how many Gen Z adults are buying. Oh, yes. I see over the past okay. like two months. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Gen X is falling slightly. Gen yes. Xers are maybe a bit turned off. Okay. But this is and only like very, past seven months. This is yeah, like. Yeah, but it's still like, a very, it was a big year, right? And it, mm -hmm. look, at the, look at the trend lines, right? Mm hmm. Um, and then look at the very bottom, baby boomers. Uh, looks like about 8% of baby boomers own crypto, okay? Mm -hmm. So if you put these charts together, you say there's $100 trillion sitting in, in the baby boomer silent generation accounts. As this money switches over, um, you don't need much, right? So let's go back. Uh, there's only uh, Bitcoin market cap is only $750 billion or $800 billion. If just 1% of the 100 trillion comes over and millennials get it, inherit it, um, or start mm -hmm. earning it, um, you double the Bitcoin price. Okay. If it's 2%, you triple the Bitcoin price. If it's 5%, Bitcoin is around $200,000. Yeah. That's only 5%. Okay. So it's a fairly straightforward argument. Again, this is Tom Lee from Fundstrat. Um, he's been talking about the demographic trends for quite a while. Uh, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but um, uh, very bullish. I've heard also other people talking about this transformation. So this is not the first time I'm hearing this. And I totally agree. I totally agree also from uh, what I've seen in my life around me. Uh, yes, there is a massive wealth, tra wealth transfer from the uh, boomers to uh, millennials and i think that's so let's combine these about. two let's go back and remember what i said mm -hmm. about the bonds uh let's go back to the bonds right so we saw the chart of the the, the here we see the the bull market's over so guess the not only will so you'll have an inheritance right you'll have uh baby boomers and silent generation are going to die right there's going to be uh, inheritance passed down to Gen X and millennials. We'll have that wealth transfer, mm -hmm. but you'll also have, perhaps you'll have the baby boomers as they retire, will readjust their portfolios because we're talking about, we were talking about the bond bull market being over. 
Yeah. So you would also see perhaps the baby boomers readjusting their retirement portfolios to include some crypto. And again, it might be just 1% or 5%, but 40% of their portfolios are bonds. Okay. Yeah. So you're going to have the wealth transfer through inheritance as well as um, a reallocation perhaps and very small percentages of both of those take Bitcoin up another five to 10 X. So we're going from our 40,000 up to 200,000 plus on very modest readjustments of these ca of these cash flows. Okay. Mm -hmm. Not to mention money printing, more money printing coming. Okay. Let's have a look at M2. Let's have a look at M2 just very real quickly. So, uh, I mean, um, all of what I just said is assuming a static uh, money printing regime, which is not going to be static, right? This is the... Um, oh, it stopped supply. a bit. <laughs> Wait a second, so, that was daily. That was daily. That was daily. Let's have a look at monthly. Yeah. So we looked at that. Um, as they print more money, um, yeah, where does that go, right? It's not sustainable, so, so they have to accelerate it. And, um, you know, where does this, this adds to inflation? Um, and it just further accelerates the, the bond prices crashing or just bonds not being interesting anymore, right? No, yeah. And so you have to say, where does the money go, right? I mean, just to step back a bit, people always say, oh, you know, growth stocks are, are, are too expensive, right? The stock market's too expensive. But people that don't that say that don't understand that there's just nowhere else for money to go. Like, where are you going to put your your money? Mm -hmm. You're going to put it into bonds. Are you going to put it into gold? Are you going to put it into real estate, stocks, or Bitcoin? There's no other. There's no other place to put it. Let's have a look at gold. You've just mentioned it. Right. I mean, gold could break it's, out. It's, it's not yeah, very popular. It looks like it's going to make a new all-time high, as yes, because now it's a uh, it's a uh, uh, there are times of risks, you know. So gold yeah. is a is a risk on asset, I believe. That's it's a risk off it. asset. No, it's a risk, risk off, off asset. risk off asset. So yeah. now when there is lots but of who's going to buy it? Who's going to buy the gold? Not the millennials. <laughs> well, yeah, and and are, not gonna are buy baby the gold. boomers going to are going to are they going to buy gold or sell it? Um, Baby boomers need income, right? Because they're retired, David. So mm -hmm. gold does not produce income. They want, they need to supplement their, their retirement um, cash flow, right? Uh, the problem with gold is it doesn't produce a cash flow, right? So, yeah. so they might, they might rather go into uh, income producing real estate, or even, mm -hmm. I mean, it sounds horrible. They might stay with bonds. At least they're getting three or 4% on that, right? Maybe um, some, some people will. <clears throat> yeah. So, I mean, gold could, I mean, gold will probably go higher, but I don't know if that's a, a major place where it's, their money's going to go. So you have to say, where's all these trillions of dollars going to go, especially with uh, the, the, the bond market uh, turning bearish? Mm -hmm. um, where will the cash flow? Yeah, the majority of it, yeah, I think it's going to come to uh, to uh, uh, stocks and the crypto. Right. But then what crypto and that we're going to talk about it in, as our last point, because we're going to argue whether Bitcoin will lose number one ranking within the three years time. Sure. So, uh, we didn't cover the KPMG or the Canada Freezes Bank accounts. Do we have time for that? Uh, let's go through it really quickly, maybe. Oh, definitely through the, uh, the Canada uh, uh, trackers incident because uh, everybody, I think, is interested in it a lot. Right. Everybody's yeah. So um, Canadian government announced emergency measures um, to shut down the Freedom Convoy, the trucker protests in Ottawa. Um, the big interest for Bitcoiners is included in that was a measure where they can freeze the bank accounts of anyone supporting the protest movement. So if you donated money to a trucker, mm -hmm. um, they can arbitrarily freeze your bank account without going through a court. But that's, that's uh, 
Oh, uh, <laughs> I, I don't want to use the inappropriate word. <laughs> I'm going to have to edit it out then. <laughs> Which word is that? <laughs> Nazi. That's Nazi. <laughs> It's uh, yeah, it's unbelievable. That's, so uh, um, I really thought better of Canada. I'm surprised right. something like this happens in Canada. Yeah, yeah, most people are. I'm so um, you know, and it does get it gets overlooked, right? People talk about Bitcoin as as you know a new asset class, but um, you know the fact that it's unconfiscatable is uh, is not priced in at all in the West. Yes, um, unless you yeah, withdraw words, it, but you, you um, have to withdraw it from yeah. the centralized exchanges of course well yeah you put it on a you know cold storage right but um i don't think it's priced in at all the risk or rather the value their use case value of being unconfiscatable hard money mm -hmm. um and the reason is you usually don't hear about bank accounts getting frozen right um yeah and it doesn't affect most rich people in north america right they they um they've never had their credit card not work or their bank account frozen or not being able to make a purchase. So um, that has, has yet to be priced in to the Bitcoin market, in my opinion. And it's also bearish for the centralized exchanges because there was a Kraken, uh, a Kraken CEO, I believe it was. Mm, I saw that, who, yeah. Who, uh, who actually publicly uh, called for people to withdraw their uh, crypto from centralized exchanges because he openly talked about that they can be forced by the government to freeze the accounts of you know the subjects involved freeze yeah. their accounts uh, on their exchanges and also uh, not being also block their deposits if they want to deposit into their account so centralized i think centralized exchanges are completely going to take going to going to get taken over by the dexes i think it it still need it still takes years to mature it's not yet matured and there are like insane gas fees for the Ethereum-based uh, DEXs, insane gas fees. So that keeps people off so far, but I think these these things are going to get solved. I, li I liked that the uh, he was honest, though. He was honest to... Um, I like that guy, actually. I forget his name, but um, he was honest saying, look, we can't... If they request us to freeze funds, we have to do it. And he's right. Mm -hmm. And he um, called out before it happened. He didn't yeah. wait for it to okay, happen. Okay, so that's an interesting segue going into our debate a little bit about whether Bitcoin will get flipped. Because uh, yeah. the ne I won't, but the next risk is what about coins that are determined to be SEC, uh, sorry, to be securities? Those coins will not be allowed on the exchanges either. Okay, which coins are those? Well, almost any coin other than Bitcoin and Ethereum has a chance of being determined to be a security, right? Mm, those coins that are decentralized, like that have a decentralized governance, do you think? Well, it doesn't matter. It, what matters is when they were sold, were they sold as an investment or not? That's the, as I believe that's the, what there's a, I forget the name of the test, but there's some sort of test they have. And basically if you issue an investment uh, and you market it, to the extent that people believe they will make money on mm -hmm. that investment it's uh -huh, considered okay. a security right mm -hmm. um and and if it's a security uh it has to be compliant to be listed um including the exchanges so if kraken or coinbase or any of these other exchanges in the us are holding a coin um that is not um sec approved um they either lose their license or they kick it off. That's my understanding. Uh, I think we are going to see the resolution of the XRP uh, SEC lawsuit. I think the resolution is going to be in the in few months. And I think that's going to tell us more about, about right. all, the, all the other coins, because the result, I think, will concern every, everybody in crypto. But Gensler, the, the head of the SEC, keeps saying basically that most of the coins whatever the 10,000 or 15,000 coins out there um are not compliant or rather they are securities right anyways so mm -hmm. why does that matter to our discussion so let's broaden the debate here um mm -hmm. is bitcoin going to be flipped um 
let's uh you said within three years i believe it will happen within like one to three years it's going to lose number one ranking i believe first okay. it's going to just lose it and then regain it back but then when it loses oh. like second time or a third time i think it's going to lose it for um maybe forever actually it's not okay. it's never gonna be number one again <laughs> and it's gonna lose to ethereum that i cannot say uh it uh, makes sense that it's going to be first ethereum but i cannot say that i think ethereum has its own issues i think what you don't hear in the in the media is that it's heavily centralized i forgot the name of the company but there is a company that owns like 90 percent of now i'm not sure about whether it's notes or uh, I, I just know it's the same company that owns the Coin Telegraph and all and many other crypto media, and you just can't, you just don't hear it anywhere that the Ethereum is massively centralized. But it is. I haven't taken the notes about it, so I'm not ready to talk about it, like you know, giving names. Right. But right. Ethereum has its own issues, and I cannot say whether it's going to flip. It's going to become number one. Maybe that's going to be the first coin that will flip uh, <clears throat> uh, Bitcoin as number one, but then Ethereum will fall as well, maybe. So, so but, Ethereum is the only yeah. one within striking distance, right? At the Ethereum moment. is, at is the about moment. half the market cap. Yes, no one else has moment. a chance in the in the near term, right? In the in the near term, no. In yeah. the upcoming months, no. Um, and again, um, you know, you could say, will Bitcoin lose market share? Yes, but will it lose so much that it would get flipped by a second coin? Uh, you know, good chance that doesn't happen because you know, Ethereum is competing with Cardano, right? And they're both competing with Solana. And then you've got Matic, right? Um, so you've got all these other, if you're going to say, well, uh, Bitcoin is, is slowly losing mark, uh, you know, market dominance, mm -hmm. but so will Ethereum um, uh, okay. to other mm -hmm. competitors. So mm -hmm. all of the coins are going to be subject to a sort of decay of market cap as other coins eat into each other, right? So, and that's exactly what I mean. Uh, that yeah. this is the process. This is a highly technical uh, world, and uh, yeah. uh, in in the technical world, the first mover is doomed to fall, in my opinion, because the first mover product is not going to make it to the mature stage of the market sector. This is not yet a mature stage. This is still emerging market. Cryptocurrencies are. It's still emerging market, right. and uh, the prototype, the, the technology gets improved on the prototype. The prototype is not going to really make it to the uh not as number one anyway right i In think um just to push back a bit um and and sure it's totally possible for bitcoin to get flipped but um i think one thing is you need to um and this is sort of michael saylor view but mm -hmm. um you need to find what is the use case of each coin right and um and then understand how large is the use case because if bitcoin is competing for the same use case as ethereum uh yeah it could be that ethereum is a better a better coin in quotations but i'm not sure that i don't think they are i don't think bitcoin and ethereum are going to compete for the same use case i, I would argue mm -hmm. i would argue bitcoin is competing for digital gold uh okay, or digital fair. asset and ethereum is competing for um smart contract or um it, it's not even competing for digital payment i don't even know if anyone will compete for digital payment um that seems to be off the table but um let's say that ethereum is competing for web web um web 3.0 or um smart contracts well you'd have to say but how big is that market um the use case for a digital store of value is in the tens of trillions of dollars. Well, okay. I think that the store of value, uh, part of it is going to be eaten by other projects. <clears throat> and especially if Bitcoin loses number one ranking, I think that's going to hurt the the perception that that's the only st uh, store of value in crypto. So they that will they will retain be. store of value. It could happen. Yeah. I think they will eat some of it, yes, as well. Yeah. It's not going to be just Bitcoin anymore. Right. Bitcoin is going to stay the brand and that's basically it and as the brand it will always exist it will always be there it's here to stay but not in number one and presumably later not even top 10. right as the time goes 
Well, let's see in one to three years' time. It's uh, it's not that far away as we might think. It might pass really, really quickly. And uh, uh, hopefully we will still know each other by then. <laughs> and then we can reflect back. We can play this uh, podcast three years from now or two years from now. And then we can, you know, reflect like what did we say and what happened and what didn't happen. Yeah, let's see what happens. Okay, so thank you very much, Curtis, for another podcast. Uh, uh, this was over one hour. I'm going to edit it a bit to make it one hour. So, and um, let's uh, let's hold on strong. Uh, I think we are stronger. We're getting stronger. And uh, uh, let's see each other in, in about two weeks again. Okay, thanks, David.